Mark Fang is the Executive Director of the Westchester County Human Rights Commission. He was appointed to the position in May of 2012 by Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino. A practicing attorney for 19 years, Mark has served as an Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division of the New York State Attorney General's Office. He has also served as an Assistant District Attorney in the Westchester County District Attorney's Office, the first Asian American to be appointed to that position in the county. Mark is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Tufts University. He received his law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center and has been in the private practice of law since 2000, where he has concentrated on litigation in both criminal and civil matters. He is a former board member of the Westchester chapter of the Organization of Chinese Americans. He is originally from Yorktown Heights and is a graduate of Yorktown High School. Mark will be focusing on the proper accommodations for handicapped that uh, multifamily buildings and complexes should be focusing on. Once again, we're very, very happy that Mark is able to join us tonight. Please welcome Mark. Yeah. Okay, I got to switch directions because I uh, this is technical stuff. I was just at the the the, the job is so. Um, just has so, so, so uh, wide a range of functions. So we do discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodation, you know, prosecution, that kind of thing, enforcement of the law. But then we also have this portfolio of race relations and more general advocacy, education, outreach. So I just came from Mount Vernon High School because there was an unfortunate, really bad incident. Uh, you might have seen it in the news with the tweeting Racial, uh, racial remarks after a basketball game. So I just uh, gave out a proclamation to those basketball players uh, for, for winning their Section 1 title and prevailing over some really just awful stuff, but they prevailed and it's a, it's a really uh, turned out to be good for them in the end. So now we're turning to, <laughs> that's racial relations, tweeting, racial remarks, fighting that stuff, and now we're, now we're turning to uh, Reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act, right, for co-ops and condos. Uh, a lot of uh, what I'm going to tell you is in the uh, joint statement of the Department of Housing and Urban Development the, uh, and the Department of Justice dated May 17, 2004, reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act. Are you familiar with that? Some of you? I know you are. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to go through it, and then maybe afterwards we can talk a little bit about it and um, <clears throat> go over some of the issues. I may not have all the answers for you, but uh, you can always uh, come to my office or call me. Uh, so reasonable accommodations. Uh, I'll just I'll just give you some background. That so kind of comes from the Fair Housing Act, Federal Fair Housing Act, and its amendments. Is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that may be necessary, necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling, including public and common use spaces. So there, the key you got to look at there, um, that's uh, uh, in contrast to reasonable modification, right? That's enough. Um, we decided to just take a look at reasonable accommodations today. We'll do another session with reasonable modification. But uh, just so you can distinguish, a reasonable modification is a structural change, you know, like a ramp or something like that made to the premises, whereas the reasonable accommodation is a change to the or exception or adjustment to rule, policy, practice, or services. Generally, under the FHA, the Fair Housing Act, which we follow, the County Human Rights Commission follows because we're a partner with HUD, uh, under um, it's called the Fair Housing and Assist uh, Fair Housing Assistance Program. We receive uh, money from them for prosecuting fair housing cases. Under the Fair Housing Act, the housing provider is responsible for the costs associated with the reasonable accommodation, unless it is in an undue financial and administrative burden. So we'll go through some of those, dig a little deeper uh, on some of those 
key key terms there. Um, <clears throat> I want to go through this kind of step by step. It's an excellent document. If you if you uh, uh, want a copy of this at some point, just tell me, and uh, you know we'll give you a copy. I didn't make uh, you know there are too many people here to make uh, that many copies for tonight, but. Uh, I used to do criminal law too, and there's something called the sentencing guidelines. And the reason why I bring that up is because in the sentencing guidelines, they have these examples at the end of the sentencing guidelines, and um, those can be cited. They're almost like uh, uh, they're almost like case law. Um, you can use those illustrations as and compare them to your own uh, situation. And it's similar here. Here, they run through different aspects of the law, and then they have these examples, very colorful examples. Uh, I, I recommend to you uh, to, to, to look at this, if you, and many, many times, uh, there'll be an example uh, that, that is it's almost exactly might be the question that you have. So we'll go through some of them, and I just picked out some of the ones that I thought were, were pertinent like dogs or parking spaces, right? That stuff comes up a lot. In our own, uh, in our own agency, those are, those are many of the cases. Emotional support animals, um, parking spaces, that make up a lot of the, case, a lot of the cases. Uh, just, uh, just to let you know, what our, our, uh, our cases, uh, we get, when we get them, uh, we, we first we see if there's a prima facie uh, if the complainant can articulate a prima facie case of discrimination. And if he can do that, uh, then we'll file a complaint against the, uh, against the building and the owner. Uh, once we file a complaint, then we'll, have, uh, we'll do our investigations very thorough. We have uh, just got another investigator on board. So we have uh, our own special staff for fair housing. We've got two investigators and a uh, Another director of fair housing, his name is Josh Levin. Uh, then we will investigate, we'll bring uh, witnesses in to interview, maybe we'll go out to the, the uh, site, and then we'll make a determination of whether or not there's probable cause uh, to proceed with the case. If there's probable cause to proceed the, with the case, then the case will be uh, sent out to a, an administrative law judge for a, a, a determination of whether or not our law was, uh, our fair housing law, the county's fair housing law was violated. Uh, an interesting thing about the fair housing uh, law in the county, we have a five member board uh, uh, that make up the fair housing, uh, fair housing board uh, appointed by the county executive. They vote on these cases for probable cause to determine whether or not there's probable cause that our laws are violated. And their vote will determine the probable cause. So we send up, we make a recommendation, and then they'll they'll vote on it. Uh, the chairman of the uh, of the fair housing board is is uh, Jerry Rudman. Some of you might know him. He's a, a lawyer in the county. Uh, you can also see the other members of the fair housing board there in the uh, on our website. Definition of disability, I'll just uh, read you some of the key components of that. Uh, I will uh, just key in for you. The, uh, the county has the human rights law, which is Article 1 of the county's law, and that has a, a, de a definition of disability, but that's for cases for uh, employment, public accommodation, credit, not for fair housing. And I looked uh, uh, just compared side by side the two definitions of disability uh, under our human rights law and our, under our fair housing law, which is just in the same booklet. Uh, you know Barry, right? When you were there from the, from the uh, commission. Were you chairman of the commission? Chairman. chairman of the commission. But uh, the definitions are different. They're subtly different, but uh, they are different. So, uh, you know, if you have a, a council, in-house council or a, an attorney, you, you got to be cautious of that. And also subtly different than um, even the, um, the, the, the you got to look and, and just don't assume um, 
you know, that disability, uh, you know, means what it means. And if you see it in one place, not the other, you got to really go back and look at our, our law. So disability under our law, I'll just read it, shall mean, well, first of all, human rights law, that's for the employment and the public accommodation, means a physical, mental, or medical impairment resulting from anatomical, physiological, genetic, or neurological conditions which prevent the exercise of an unimpaired bodily function or is demonstrable by medically accepted clinical or laboratory diagnostic techniques, et cetera, et cetera, right? But it's different than the Fair Housing Law, and you'll, you'll see it right away. A disability on the Fair Housing Law, 700.20D, shall mean a physical, mental, comma, psychological or medical impairment resulting from anatomical, physiological, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit different. That psychological word's not in there. What's the consequence of that? I, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> we can get to that. But we'll, we'll maybe let's get a case to see it. But my point here is it's different uh, than, the, than the, other, the other body of law, the main body of law. Fair housing law in the counties is new. So, um, you know, we don't have, haven't had a lot of cases, uh, so, that, you know, in terms of precedent and that kind of thing, uh, only since 2008, 2009. Uh, a couple of them have come up to the, uh, to the appellate division. If you, if you, our cases uh, would get appealed to uh, the Supreme Court appellate division our, uh, under Article 78. Uh, under the under the uh, the Fair Housing Act, Federal Fair Housing Act, defines a person with a disability to include individuals with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Physical or mental impairment would be um, such such diseases as or conditions as orthopedic, visual, speech, and hearing impairments, cerebral palsy autism, epilepsy, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, uh, AIDS, mental retardation, emotional illness, drug addiction, and alcoholism. Uh, I think uh, more to the point, rather than, you know, memori you know, remembering what I'm saying, is it's all in here, in this joint statement. So, like I said again, this is almost like a real valuable manual along with maybe the case law that you get, but a real valuable manual that can show you, uh, you know, give you a roadmap for any, for the situations you might face. <laughs> Substantially limits, again, they describe that, suggests that the limitation is significant or to a large, uh, or to a large degree. Major life activity, they define that, means those activities that are of central importance to daily life, such as seeing, hearing, walking, breathing, performing manual tasks, caring for oneself, learning, and speaking. Because, you know, when I do my cases, when we go to analyze for probable cause and investigate, we're, we're going to use this and the examples of this. So uh, that's why, you know, this is a great source. Uh, go over some of the other ones here. So there has to be a, a nexus between the requested accommodation the requested reasonable accommodation and the individual's disability. The nexus, that's the key, uh, key word. And they give you some examples here. I'm just going to go through three of them because they're, they're very um, uh, common. I, I Kenneth, Kenneth sent me an email about one of these that kind of matches on the parking spaces. Where's Carl? Carl's not here today. <laughs> okay. I was going to have him sit, stand here so he could bail me out. That's why he didn't come. <laughs> so, so example one uh, is, uh, is a parking situation. This is a common occurrence. Uh, I'll read you the example that they give because uh, it's, it's a good one. It just goes right to the point. A housing provider has a policy of providing unassigned parking spaces to residents. A resident with a mobility impairment who is substantially limited in her ability to walk requests an assigned accessible parking space close to the entrance to her unit as a reasonable accommodation. There are available parking spaces near the entrance to her unit that are accessible 
but those spaces are available to all residents on a first-come, first-served basis. Rule. The provider must make an exception to its policy of not providing assigned parking spaces to accommodate this resident. We can talk about that later, you know, if you want to dig into it a little bit more, hypothetically, or... Uh, Mark, Mark, what about switching somebody who has a parking space right next to the door has asked for years, and now you want to, the person wants to have that person Yeah, we, we, we had a kid. We, had, we just had a case like that. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Was that you? Was that involved? Well, it, the, you know, the re a request for a reasonable accommodation might, might come to bear on other tenants. So uh, I think that, that, that that's maybe what, what, what would have to happen at the end of the day. Yes? Are you talking about a personalized space or just a handicap spot? Yeah. So let's say, like, let's say what they, let's say the person makes a reasonable accommodation, because this was Ken's question, uh, Ken's question, whether or not the person should get their own personalized space. I'm saying it's not a sign parking. Yeah. Yeah, but the person, I guess it's a, the bottom line is the person may have to get their own space, because, uh, Let's say the person asks for a space close to the door, and the answer by the building is, uh, you know, we have a, uh, we got, we got, we got two spot, two uh, handicap spots right there. Uh, you know, you should be able to get one of those. If that works out, then maybe that's the reasonable accommodation. But if it doesn't, and you know, every. Every couple of days, he's shut out. He or she's shut out of those two spots. Then you're gonna to have to do more. That's uh, I think that's the way I analyze it. Uh, no pets. This is another example. A housing provider has a no pets policy. A tenant who is deaf requests that the provider allow him to keep a dog in his unit as a reasonable accommodation. The tenant explains that the dog is an assistance animal that will alert him to several sounds, including knocks at the door, sounding of the smoke detector, the t telephone ringing, and cars coming into the driveway. The housing provider uh, rule. The housing provider must make an exception to its no pets policy to accommodate this tenant. So this is a situation we see often. Uh, we've had a couple cases. I think there, there is one even that went all the way to the, uh, to the appellate division. And from my reading of the law on these uh, emotional support animal cases, the service dog animal cases, service animal cases, uh, you know, that's, that's accepted at this point. That's not really what's in question. Uh, no, emotional support animal, emotional support. service dog is certainly not in question. But in the emotional support realm, that seems to be well settled at this point. What's not settled is the, is the, is the evidence, the quantity of evidence and the quality of evidence that you may need to show that this is truly needed by the, the complainant. How much is the board able to make the inquiry? What's that? How much is the board able to make the inquiry? The man medical, I, I found there's been some issues with the availability, the availability of getting the medical documentation that someone claims that's an invasion, that they're not required to show it all. You would call that a law? Yeah, correct. That's Which case was that? <laughs> when, when was that? When was that? Peak skill, right. What, what's your name? Combination for a dog, Ms. Eleven tells all the public's client and us that um, the, the individual making What's your name again? Oh, I talked to you. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. I think we talked about that, yeah, when I first came on. We have to show some proof. I mean, otherwise you're going to, you're wasting your time. You're going to get, I, I think you're going to get that. It, it won't be, that wouldn't be, uh, I don't think it would be sustained. Well, you lost. You you lost in, in here, yeah. but then when you went back up, when you went up there... No, we, we didn't pay the fee, it was going to be too expensive, we wanted to buy the But, you know, basically, your department ruined this woman's life. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, in the end, that's what happened. 
Yeah. Well, my, my roadmap for those cases is going to be the appellate division, second department cases. And there's a number of cases on the on that. I don't have them handy here tonight, but that that will be my roadmap for how we'll, we'll how we'll proceed. Uh, you know, in terms of what evidence we're going to require uh, to show the emotional support animal cases. I think that the problem is that's being discussed now about the evidence is, is precedes when they file the actual claim. They would have to produce the evidence in a claim. But often what happens is, in my experience, mm -hmm. the person threatens it. They get a lawyer, and the lawyer writes a letter. And then we respond, we say, well, show us the evidence. And what this gentleman was saying is, well, you know, we don't have to, and then they go. So the board isn't given a fair shot at trying to resolve the problem before it's a problem. Mark, just repeat that. Just repeat that. question? Yeah, and so the, I think there should be some requirement that before it gets to you, they have to make a good faith effort with the board. Before it gets to me or before... before yeah, in other words, uh, you shouldn't hear a case if yeah. they have not been forthcoming to a board so they can make a, a fair assessment. Yeah, well, uh, I'm trying to set up some, you know, a system and procedures for screening these cases to just put a little bit more reliability and predictability into the process. Uh, the housing is a different situation because we have HUD requirements, but I agree with you on that. Uh, maybe we could have some kind of indicia to make sure uh, you know they don't just come in with nothing. But that's the what, that's why I have this kind of prima facie uh, prima facie case requirement, and maybe that's where that fits in. the building has to incur uh, costs for, uh, for, uh, for allowing someone a reasonable accommodation. So in that instance, that might be something that the building would have to bear. Point out, I think, is really helpful for. Uh, yeah, one thing, I th one thing that, one thing you'll see in this uh, this document, the joint statement, that uh, I think is very interesting. I think a lot of cases would would uh, I think it would help a lot of building owners. And it's in the document here. It's not. Uh, it's not in the uh, in the case law. In the uh, in the cases. In one case, uh, it said that you don't have to do it, but. It, this uh, statement recommends that you do it, and that's called uh, interactive process. You familiar with that? So in the employment realm, that is uh, that's required. If uh, in the disability uh, disability law, if a person asks for uh, a reasonable accommodation in employment, uh, there has to be an interactive process between the employer and the employee. And that becomes a question of fact, whether or not they engage in that. I'm just bringing this up because I see a lot of cases like that where, they do, where uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, and I see that in the housing realm, too. And 
uh, if you look at the cases, it's not required. But if you look at this uh, joint statement, they rec they strongly recommend it. And I think it would it really um, I think it would go a long way for you guys or your clients uh, to think about engaging that interactive process and having that uh, record of that. Uh, that's just something that jumped out at me when I was doing my review for this presentation. the nexus between their disability and uh, the need for a pet versus some other alternative. But it's funny that uh, there's also language in here that says that the, the, the dis disabled person would know, had, would know the best of what, what he needs. <laughs> you'd also have to show, yeah. But then, you know, I guess you'd also have to show we go into all the factual balance. You know, why not a pet? What's the what's the burden on? Because you requested specifically the doorbell, the smoke yeah. detector, and the phone. That's why not. It could play out like that. It could play out like that. I I was going to ask this question, but some of the discussion around the table that has been sparked by your your presentation uh, makes me think that I'm asking this question for a bunch of people in the room, and that is. Did your office spend any time discussing how to avoid being a tool for people who just want to be exempt from the house rules that they signed off on, they knew they were running into, and now they don't want to be to the detriment of other shareholders who are living around them because the accommodation that they want, which I would call preferential treatment, that they want is to the detriment of the peaceful enjoyment of other people. That's my question. You guys I can't believe I'm ending up today being called a tool. <laughs> <laughs> I have no nice word for it. Your office, yeah. not you. Yeah, well, I think actually if you, uh, and I'm, con I'm very uh, conscious of that, of the reputation of, of, of an agency like this, uh, and I think that's why we were trying to instill very reliable, uh, screening for the cases and you'll see I think that'll play out and also I think if you look at uh, the statistics we don't have uh, we don't uh, not everything that walks in the door gets a, gets a complaint filed it, a very very small number get a probable cause finding if you if you if you look at the stats especially since I've been there we haven't had a we haven't even had a hearing on a case yet. Uh, just about every, we haven't had any hearings. No hearings in 2013. When did you walk in the door? May 2012. Okay, well, I think a lot of people in this room can tell you what might have preceded your presence. And I, yeah, we're very scrutinizing. Uh, you know, I, I mean, if we find something that uh, it has probable cause for, for uh, and is a violation of uh, the fair housing law, we're going to proceed with the process, but if you look at the stats, uh, it's it doesn't really bear out to, to what you're saying. Yeah, uh, the joint statement of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Justice reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, May 17, 2004. Yeah, I could I I uh, email it to you. Okay. 
Uh, are you getting my email? And so I'm like Mary, or I'm like Mark, CF8, the number 8, at westchestergov.com. MCF8 at westchestergov.com. Albert, Dorothy Finger just had a pretty good suggestion. Mark can email me the document, and if anyone oh, wants yeah. a copy of the document, I'll, you guys email me, and I'll be happy to send that. <laughs> But if, you know, you know my email is Jeff. Yeah, Jeff at Builders Institute. Process because I, I know that would help building owners uh, for the for your for the record when you're faced with allegations, uh, but other things too. But we're here to be proactive and uh, be informative and let you know how you can avoid a problem and how you can best uh, you know stiffen your hand when you do have a problem. So that's one of the mandates that uh, you know one of the charges that uh, the county executive gave. So. Maybe it's a new direction, I, I don't know. But uh, Mark, we're, we're conscious of what you say. Mark, I have one question for Boris. Question me is their attorney saying you're allowing a pedic. We came to this building because it's a no pet building. I have an allergy. Why aren't you making a reasonable accommodation for me? Because that cat or that dog is affecting me now, and I need a reasonable accommodation. So the board is damned if they do. Damned if they don't, and I presume that your organization does some type of balancing act weighing the equities of which disability is worse uh, and who should be more fairly uh, accommodated or somehow. But the boards are at a quadrant or at annual meetings that people say, I am allergic, I have to sell my apartment because you allowed this dog. I, it, it's not a good, there's no winning answer here. that the person's asking for uh, is a threat to the health and safety of, uh, of the other, other uh, occupants. Then that, 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 would, that would affect the, 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 calcula the calculation. 
exact situation. They said, well, in that case, you have to make reasonable accommodations for both of us. So we be careful what you ask for. Right. By the way, what you should do is ask that person whether or not to I, I'm sorry to interrupt the conversation, but we, we do have to stop the program now because of Mark's time for space. I, I would like you all to uh, help me in thanking Mark Fang. Thank